which is one of only three being offered in the entire United States by the Department of Defense. And at age 17, you become the youngest member of the uh, American person to take the uh, intelligence uh, oath in the intelligence department. And you then proceed to enroll in the university of your choice, which is Georgetown. And you work at the Pentagon. Yeah, just an average 17-year-old. Just an average 17-year-old. <laughs> and I have to say, Amy Mullen, uh, oh, well, by the way, she becomes fluent in Italian. And I have to say that uh, your legs are the most normal part of you. Yeah. <laughs> because you have, you defy description on so many different levels. But what I want to know is, what was it? They were working in the Pentagon. And then you decide that you are going to become a world-class athlete. Tell us about that. Yeah, well that was, just, it was, it was an adventure. And, you know, I knew that I, I needed an academic scholarship to get to university. You know, in, in the United States, our, our higher education system is extraordinarily expensive. And I was the third person in my family to go to university, and I knew it was, it was on my own shoulders to find out how I was going to do that. So, I had a job since I was 12. I delivered newspapers every morning, and I had my babysitting job and my lawn mowing job, and, you know, added all, up, all of that up, and it, it wasn't going to pay for books. The first year of, of college, so I was so fortunate to win the scholarship. And so excited to have this top secret security clearance at the Pentagon until I found out that I couldn't find out who shot JFK either. It didn't do me any good. And, um, and I quickly realized that in this massive, massive uh, bureaucratic organization, um, my, my spirit, my adventure spirit uh, would have to be suppressed. And I wasn't prepared to to make that trade. And so for me, the, the output of sport was a possibility of another life and a way to, um, you know, pay back the scholarship and, and see what came, came afterwards. And really, it was the first thing in my life where my sense of my own auto autonomy was realized. And it wasn't something that my parents imposed. It wasn't something I signed up for because my friends were doing it. Um, and it, it wasn't even a passion. It was a test of my own discipline because my nature is much more artistic and, you know, I, I indulge my curiosity and... I mean, rather short time frame. Yeah, I had 11 months. I had 11 months to transform myself into a Division One, in the United States, Division One collegiate is the top. It, it, they're the Olympians, they're, they're who go on to be world champions. And Georgetown was ranked third in the country. And um, I like, you know, Billie Jean King, great Billie Jean King, said something to me once that I'll never forget. She said, "Amy, pressure is a privilege," and I have embraced that um, ability to perform under pressure. So you did that and it opened an extraordinary new world for you. Tell us a bit about uh, what happened to you once you started winning those uh, races. Well, I, I had always been um, very athletic and I grew up with two younger brothers and I, it was, I was a very physical child. I mean, I learned to walk on prosthetics, so riding bikes and swimming and everything that would happen, happened Indeed, this was my, my artificial self began in the brain, I guess is the way to say it. I mean, I always imagined the ground under me. I imagined what it feels like to walk on stones or gravel or slide into second base playing baseball. So, you know, to have this extraordinary experience of, of being, arriving in track and field at just the right time where someone like me, a, a bilateral entity, is considered to have the, the, the worst case scenario of amputees because most amputees are, are, have one flesh and bone limb. 
and the idea is to achieve symmetry. So your height, weight, pronation of the feet, the alignment is determined. And for me, that's not the case. Um, I provide aesthetics my whole life for every prosthetist that was to build my leg. And so I found somebody who was an inventor. And the idea was this, if I was trying to be the fastest woman in the world on the artificial leg, and I didn't trust to have human legs, then why were we looking at them? Why were we looking at the fastest thing that runs, which is a cheetah? And a, and a cat runs like a professional sprinter does on the ball of their feet. So those, you know, learning to, be, being the, the first person in the world on, on these legs that have since revolutionized prosthetics and forever changed the way the athletes who wear them would be perceived was certainly a stroke of, of good fortune um, for me, but it was also an understanding of a shift. I spent my childhood and my teenage years just wanting to be normal, just wanting people to look past the legs and, and see me. And to see the extraordinary anyway. Well, in fact, what I, what I realized is that I was not normal. I was never going to be normal. Why would I want to be normal with the next phase of that thinking down the, down, the, down the line? But also that I had invited a life that was extraordinary. And I was also inviting people to be a part of that by being so public about this exploration with my body and this this performance really, this storytelling with my body as an athlete. And that just kind of opened the doors to fashion and art and all you know, and I mean you actively pursued change. I mean change the theme of this, this forum. I mean you actively pursued change. Well I do because what was offered to me was, was very depressing. You know, I was I was consistently told the child what I would never have, what I would never be, and would never be able to do. I just knew they were wrong. I just knew they were wrong. And so I... I just realized that I was talking to the wrong people. Sometimes you just have to stop talking to people that say no, and go find the people that say yes. <laughs> And you also advise Oscar Pistorius as well. 